My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. I call people make friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job, not just to entertain, but to explain. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. At the beginning of the year, brokerage houses love to name their favorite themes for the next 12 months. Usually they just look at what stocks are going up and then pick themes that fit. It is pure artifice, people. Not the best way to go about teaching or making predictions. But they're told to do it. And theirs is just to do or die. <laughs> Me? I like to lay out themes you can fall back on all year. Themes that you buy on the down days. Like this one where the Dow shed 94 points. S&P tumbled 0.56%. NASDAQ dropped 0.59%. And again, at one point, it was down a lot more. But people keep buying these intraday dips. They can't buy, resist. Buy, buy, buy. Not a good sign, frankly. There's a reason I've been telling you to have lots of cash on the sidelines. Something I've repeatedly stressed to the investor club. And I'll tell you, the investing club people will seem to respond pretty well to it. You need cash to participate when stocks get put on sale. And if you understand the themes behind them, you won't get shaken out by a bad tape. You'll use it to your advantage. You know what it's like? It's like kind of having a map when you're engulfed in the fog of war. So let me give you my favorites. They're a little different. My first thought is a theme grafted on to an observation. Obviously, given the strength of the Magnificent Seven coming into the year, everyone's going to have an opinion about whether they can keep running. Me? No. I want to queue up the Elmer Bernstein score, put on my best Eli Wallach face, huddle with John Sturgis to figure out which of the seven is going down early. Which of them is Harry Luck, the character played by Brad Dexter, who gets shot pretty early in the scuffle? I mean, who's to say we need all seven? Only three survived the movie. To me, it's looking a little like Tesla will be the first to fall. We have a CEO who's gotten a little petulant again, talking about needing to control 25% of the company in order to innovate. I guess it's not enough to have 13% be the richest man in the world. Elon, bad look. I know he identifies with Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride, a.k.a. Mandy Patinkin. But to me, he's about to be taken out by Calavera, Eli Wallach's brilliant bad guy in The Magnificent Seven. Just like in the movie, The Seven Were Never Buddies. Did you know that? First to be shot, Harry Luck thinks that he's down in Mexico not to rescue the villagers, but to find a hoard of gold. Now, just to switch metaphors a little, he's kind of like the Dobbsy figure in Treasure Sierra Madre. Yeah, Bogart. So is Musk, he's kind of like Dobbs and uh, Harry. I mean, really, can you imagine, just, just humor me, can you imagine Jensen Wong coming on air and saying he needs five times his current holdings if he's going to do some super duper, duper generative AI? I mean, can you imagine that? Pure hubris, which is why Tesla might be the first to exit the seven. Of course, Tesla lovers have none of this. I get a piece of research a day that says that Apple's going to have a terrible quarter because of a slowdown in China. The uniform nature of this view is so ingrained that any Apple analyst who's watching is capping that I haven't chosen Apple to fall from its horse first. But then again, do you know apparently Robert Vaughn begged not to be killed first in the movie? So who knows? Maybe we're going to end up with three amigos or something. So I'm not looking for the seven to rise or fall together. I'm looking for the others to join the seven. Ideally, we need about 300, eh, 300 Spartans worth of breath from the SP 500. But we're not going to get that. Still, it's far more likely that the makeup changes. That's right. Even I suspect the seven will always be uniquely tied up with AI. Second theme, the election. Now, I keep hearing this is an election year. In election years, the market typically goes up higher. Yeah, for president. Yeah, actually, I'm not that sure. I think there are elections, and then there's this election, which is highly unusual for reasons you don't need me to explain. I will say, though, that there's never been a president more friendly to the stock market than Trump was. He measured himself by the Dow. Maybe he should use the S&P 500 for a broader yardstick. To be cynical about it, I think Trump will fight for rich people like no other. And given that everybody aspires to be rich, it'll go over well. I could see him saying that we need to cut the capital gains tax to boost investment. Oh, that would send the market soaring. I don't know if the Fed will not pay attention to the putative candidate's platform, but Trump never struck me as a man of great restraint. His musings and the strong possibility that Biden might have to tack to the right to stand a chance would amount to a better than usual uh, time for the stock market. That said, I don't want to fall back on the election year theme yet until I see the whites of the rise. It may, it may not be worth it. Third, after going to the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference, I need to reiterate that these GLP-1 drugs are the real deal. You need some exposure to the space because anything that can stop diabetes, crush obesity, lower blood pressure, knock off heavy drinking, moderate COPD, and who the hell, what, heck knows what else they can do, is something that every drug company wants a piece of. 
I don't care if you make the syringes like Becton to consider work on a protein booster like Abbott Labs or develop a companion drug that helps ease the loss of muscle like Regeneron or make the shot once a month and not once a week like Amgen. It's an imperative for all pharma to be in on the GLP-1 hunt. I also believe that the food companies that were mowed down like the first day of the zone when we first heard of these wonder drugs should take advantage of this interregnum to adapt maybe less sugar, more protein. And of course, you can just go buy the stock of Eli Lilly. Fourth theme, we may look back on 2024 as the year that China collapses under its own communist weight. I just can't see how this leader and his policies can get China back on track. Is it really in Xi's ideological DNA to stop gunning for the wealthy, even if they've created a ton of jobs? Do you think this guy can be gracious to America and not stab us in the back while our people are still in the tarmac before they even leave the PRC? Does anyone believe that China can regain its standing with an economy based on um, empty apartment buildings? Finally, one more uh, for now. Mergers and acquisitions are back. Ignore the collapse of the JetBlue Spirit Airlines deal. That one was dead on arrival. I told you that a long time ago. Even as people seem oblivious to the already anti-competitive nature of the airline industry. I think the combination of the federal beatdown by the judge who pants the FTC for trying to block the harmless Microsoft Activision deal and the embarrassing fight then fold act with Amgen buying Horizon Therapeutics tells me that the days when you need to sell a stock because that a bad quarter may be over. How many deals actually start when a company's stock is down and an investment banker picks up the phone and says, hey, we got an opportunity here? Yet until now, we knew, we knew that every deal would be fought by the regulators. The pent-up M&A will be huge in 2024, so don't give up the bad quarter ship. Suitors might beck it. Oh, and one last theme. We need to think about how wrong this forward yield curve is. It's absurd that anyone's betting uh, that we could have six rate cuts this year. I'd rather bet that the Eagles will somehow find themselves into the Super Bowl. After getting trounced by the Buccaneers the other day, one and not done. So here's the bottom line. I'll have a lot more themes as the year goes on because I'm not constrained by that calendar. But right now, unless you are indeed Yul Brenner or Steve McQueen, it's going to be a wild year where a lot of money will be made, even as some formerly beloved stocks do indeed bite the dust. Anna in Massachusetts. Anna. Hello, Jim. Thanks for taking my call. How are you today? Oh, I am doing well. How about you? I'm good. Thanks. Uh, I'm a student over from Westfield State University over in Massachusetts. Quick shout out to my professor, Dr. Fiore. Sounds good. I had a quick question about Snowflake, ticker code SNOW. Um, I've been watching it for some time. What are your thoughts? Should I should I buy it? Okay. In it? Uh, this is a great question. Now, I think Snowflake, who's run by the incredibly brilliant Frank Slootman, has a product that will make it so if you don't want to spend a boatload on AI, you can find you can rent snow and see how it goes. It's kind of like uh, newly from uh, Urban Outfitters, you know, rent the rent the uh, spaceway or whatever, rent the jetway, rent the uh, cloudway. But I have to tell you, I think the stock is terrific. You should buy it. I wish it would kind of go down a little and then fill in that gap and then go higher. But I think you got a good one. I want to and good shout out there too. Let's go to Martin in Texas, please, Martin. Oh yeah, Jimbo. All right, man. I've what's happening? Of yours. Uh... Hey, what's going on, man? Uh, I've been a big fan of yours for a few years now, and uh, I've learned a lot from watching your show, and I just appreciate everything that you do for us. Well, thank uh, you. Shout out to my family as well. Um, I just want to know what you think about Etsy. I've been holding it for, for a couple of years now, um, but I'm thinking if, uh, I, if I should sell it. So I'm No, just, no, uh, not down here, not down that. here. Look, I have total faith that Josh Silverman will come up with a formula because this is an $8 billion company that everybody in America knows. That kind of brand name is hard to find. In an M&A now inspired world, this company will not be independent if it stays down here. There, I said it. You know what I feel like going right now? I feel like going to Anthony in New York. Anthony. Jim, how are you? A long time listener. We love you out here from Staten Island. I can tell you that. Uh, All right, big guy. (laughs) My question for you is safe. With the news yesterday coming from the DOJ, blocking the merger between Spirit and JetBlue. Do you think it's time we double down on Spirit? Perhaps there is an appeal, or maybe Frontier comes back in with an offer? No, no. I think we just uh, we, we, uh, cut our losses here. We just take the pain. It is like what Mr. T predicted uh, for Rocky. It's, it's, it, it, it's pain. And I don't have any. I, I have no salve. I, I don't have anything. I don't. Does anyone have any like antibiotics or something? Maybe there's some like Neosporin. That needs Neosporin. It needs like just kind of Sarna. It needs Sarna. All right. Anyway, I have a feeling that it's going to be a wild year where a lot of money could be made, even in some formerly beloved stocks. And yes, maybe even some of those Magnificent Seven do bite the dust. I love Robert Vaughn and Man from Uncle, but that dates me. 
Anyway, on Man Money tonight, the SEC recently approved trading of a new Bitcoin ETP. But are investors really getting the protections they expect? I'm digging into what an ETP really is and whether it's actually some place that you really want to put your money. Then, with the Iowa caucuses already finished, I'm going off the charts to find out what this election year could mean for the market. And I'm taking a closer look at two big banks' earnings reports to find out what they're saying about their stocks and about the state of capital markets in 2024. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.